Mm, I was actually intrigued at um, something you mentioned in uh, in another interview. Um, you were touching upon um, uh, ancient uh, Irish um, symbolism and mythology. Yeah, and and I think it's very much related. It's um, now I don't want to jump straight into the whole Terence McKenna and, and and small elves, but but I will actually hint at the fact that some people might be more sensitive or able to com communicate these um, phenomena um, in, in a way that normal people don't because they don't have the language skills. I, I tend to say that uh, these um, discoveries must have been made by either shamans or communicated by chieftains or kings. Yes, I agree, and it, it was probably through, I don't know if you've read uh, uh, Graham Hancock's Supernatural, It's the book is probably terribly overwritten, but the, the fundamental crux, I think he was trying to impress academics, who'll, mainstream academics will never be impressed with his work and his research anyway, just because well, he's, not, he's not one of them. Exactly. So, unfortunately, what could have been one of the greatest books ever written and most important books ever written has a tendency that he, he tended to overwrite it and overstate the argument. But at the crux of the the crux at the very heart of supernatural, and I actually think of many. It is this when you spoke, you mentioned the ancient Irish motifs and stuff like that that you would see on these various tombs and monuments around Ireland and around Europe in general. Uh, there's these actual shapes, these, these, there's a certain group of them. There's a group of about 15 of them that have been identified. If you put an electric current to a brain, to a, to a certain parts of the brain, while a human being has their eyes closed and they're in a dark room, they will start to see shapes. They tend to be everything from a circle with a dot in the middle, and then it's kind of star shapes. And this is probably what the first artist, the cave artist, saw when they were in the dark. There may be aided by hallucinogenic uh, substances such as uh, Liberty Cat mushrooms or whatever the local uh, transcendental you know, foliage was that brought them to that state. But definitely, that's that's it. That's that's where it all comes from. But even that in itself is interesting because that showed up when the development of the, uh, the frontal lobes and the frontal cortexes of the human brain appeared. And so did language and so did art at the same time. Uh, there's some very good, well, there's some very good, I would say, anecdotal evidence to suggest that perhaps human beings come into contact with what we would call shaman shaman shamanistic plants actually launched uh, the modern man away from the earlier sort of prototypical human beings into what we would call modern man in terms of our cognitive processes and uh, our, our, our actual, you know, our actual self-actualization in terms of coming to terms with what we are. It's, I think uh, it's a great argument to be made for that. And also it's um, when um, early or primitive man um, came into contact not just with the uh, um, effects of the entheogens and, and, and things like that, but also, I believe, um, phenomenon that, that, is, um, that is strange. Once you actually start thinking about it, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, like if you didn't have the math to describe something like uh, the Fibonacci numbers, right? It's, it's profound to see these patterns of pentagons in plants, different plants, in trees, uh, the fact that uh, your foot is the length of your arm, uh, the fact that your thumb is, uh, is, is a, a fraction of uh, the, the, the next finger, all these magical phenomena um, that I believe to explain them of course it must have taken some sort of special person and and i keep coming back to the shaman that that he must have been thinking about these things and trying to make heads and tails of it and then put them into some sort of magical system by having um a a sort of a grimoire or um a system of uh, uh language to describe that and this is also yes. what you see in the in the in the memory techniques with the the rules of three and uh, things like uh, verse f to describe plants. 
Yes. And, 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 and one of the things that, that I think is profound, especially with Irish culture, is that it has retained so much of that underneath, right? I think that was true until about 20 years ago, and I've actually seen a deterioration in that. I would say that the generations today, the ones not involved in, say, music, you know, traditional music or dance or something, they've definitely lost it. You would get it in people who would be involved in arts. I'm not talking about, like, the main arts. I'm talking about, like, even even kids who are interested in it just as a hobby, which still exists, actually, quite surprisingly to a, a large degree here. Uh, that came, that was probably a sort of a, a, a you know, you think of like, you know, what is culture and how does culture survive? Well, it's sort of like a sense of secret symbols, uh, secret, I don't know, it's all these nuances that exist below the actual, the actual, uh, you know, overriding obvious culture where two people from the same culture can arrive in a different part of the world and they may never they may be from different different class structures within that culture but they can recognize and talk to each other in a way that uh, they couldn't talk to someone from Denmark or someone from Denmark couldn't talk to someone from Italy it's just the way it is there is a there is a relative language a lexicon of consciousness that exists within cultures and this is why i think there's a a great obsession with destroying cultures within this sort of new political framework this global framework they're developing there is a you know i call it the i call it the uh, the lexicon of the ab- absolute and the relative i use this for a lot of things my art my writing my work on psychopaths there's the you know it's it's that interrelation between what is obvious and what is you know known and then what is the subtle uh, what's the word the subtle undercurrent below that and i believe the actual relative nature of the human condition is far more important than any kind of surface level cultural or educational or political or any kind of ego-based uh, you know overcoat you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it's a subtle undercurrent you know of the relative that that lexicon of the relative below the absolute which is the defining factor in cultures and i think this is extremely threatening and extremely dangerous to uh, any you know any sort of political structure or especially a commercial structure but believe it or not a, an educational structure would probably see it as the most dangerous threat of all you know one of the things i fascin constantly fascinates me about going around ireland you can go around the rem- most remote parts of ireland i'm talking about like really you, you know mountainous areas that are pretty, pretty remote today but a hundred years ago or 150 years ago they would have been incredibly remote you know they were still had public school systems these people had nothing else they had you know a lack of food a lack of everything in their lives but their children were still forced to go to school and the reason for that was they were they were indoctrinating future generations towards the uh, the political and social structure and this is why they wouldn't you know you would have like uh, when, when the British government at that time ran, ran Ireland you would have the extensive parliamentary debates regarding funding say people who were dying of starvation uh, should we send them a, a bit of food in certain areas but when it came to something like should we have a very expensive school buildings program in these remote mountain regions and the same thing happened in Scotland and Wales absolutely that was signed off right away why because they know they knew the purpose of indoctrinating these sort of like we will call them the you know the, the Celtic fringe people as they're known into the uh, into the Anglo-Saxon cultural framework was extremely important and it was the most important thing and that's why they went to such extremes to push their education system in there because I can tell you these people were very different if you still like when I was a kid there were still remote islands off the coast of Ireland you could actually visit on your your summer holidays and these people were just like the gypsies I spoke about earlier on they had a very different way of seeing the world and that was because they were not exposed to the same car culture the rest of us were Uh, they were much more right brain focused i've met some of the most uh, i would say intellectually astute people now not in terms of their overall sort of book smarts but definitely in terms of their in, in, inquisitive nature for
for uh, learning and knowledge would be like two farmers on the side of mountains who've never left a mountain. It's because they haven't been uh, culturally polluted. They have retained an ability to see, you know, to, to develop, to they retain the cognitive process which allows them a more holistic view of reality. Um, but and, there, and as a result, they're open to things the rest of us are not. It's fairly, it's really, really interesting when you see how different these people are. Uh, even the way, the, like the Irish, you know, a, a few years ago, I tried to learn Egyptian hieroglyphs because I thought that would really help my right brain. You know, because they're because the hieroglyphs are more pictorial in nature rather than uh, you know written symbols. And the book that I I had uh, was terribly disappointing, and so was all the textbooks I could find. What basically did was they invented this thing called in the Victorian era called transliteration, which turns the uh, the image of the pictograph into a a word basically and then you're right back to zero you're back in your left brain again so the, the, the lengths that they have gone to to keep us locked in the left brain it's really quite astounding and there's only, the only reason for that is that the, you know a brain that's finely balanced between left and right is, uh, is one that's it's, it's less easier to mold